So for every chapter from now until the end of the book, um, I'm going to be talking about some specific pathologies that have to do with that area of the nervous system um, as a way to sort of ground things clinically and um, give you an idea of the importance of that area. Because a lot of times um, in the history of neurology, um, they didn't really find out. Now we have a few more interesting imaging um, and diagnostic tools that um, we've never had before. But um, up until really the latter half of the, the latter, the end of the 20th century, the only way to tell um, definitively what a sp uh, specific structure or area of the brain did um, is when it was damaged, what didn't go right. So uh, there's um, there are a lot of things that were sort of found out by people that had injuries or damage, and, um, and then we'd say, oh, well, how does this function in this person, and how does this function in this person? So just comparison. They did it by comparison, basically. And um, it's an interesting way to find things out, um, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't necessarily give you any good diagnostic um, capabilities. So the neuroimaging that's available now actually gives us much better diagnostic capabilities, even though there's still a lot of things like Parkinson's. There is no way to um, definitively test for Parkinson's. And the way they do it is by um, clinically, by symptoms, and how they react to the Parkinson's medications. So um, there are a lot of um, neurological, neurodegenerative um, diseases that they're, it's difficult to diagnose. Fibromyalgia is another one there's not a definitive test for. Um, there are some that used to be diagnosed clinically, but now there are definitive tests for um, multiple sclerosis being one of them. Um, you can, there's imaging and um, immunoassays that can be performed now that you can definitively um, diagnose MS when those sclerotic uh, plaques are present. So um, progress is definitely being made. And um, ALS, um, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, uh, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, um, used to be one that couldn't, didn't have any way to diagnose. And now um, in 2012, the gene responsible for ALS was discovered, and now you can be tested for that. So um, uh, there's, there continues to be progress in the diagnosis of, of illness. So that's pretty neat. So in terms of um, neuroinflammation, we talked about inflammation in pathology and in uh, modalities class. Um, and we know with any kind of inflammation in the body, there are beneficial and harmful effects. Inflammation is usually the, um, our body's response to trauma or, or infection or disease. So neuroinflammation is the central nervous system's response to infections, disease, and injuries. So the beneficial effects of neuroinflammation, inflammation, just like um, in the rest of the body, it initiates intervention to clean up and remove debris. So in the rest of the body, we get macrophages cleaning up our debris. Um, in the central nervous system, we get microglia cleaning up the debris. So they're the macrophages of the central nervous system. Um, the harmful effects of neuroinflammation can be the death of neurons and oligodendrocytes and the inhibition of neural generation. So the correlation between normal glial activity and neural damage in stroke, um, there's a correlation, I mean, between abnormal um, glial activity and neural damage in stroke, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and MS. So um, after a stroke, and we'll talk about this in the neuroplasticity chapter, some of the cells die because if it's an ischemic stroke um, or a hemorrhagic stroke, they die because of loss of their blood supply. Other cells in the area die because of the harmful effects of neuroinflammation. So um, it, it can be a really um, a cascade effect, and it can affect more area than the area that was um, originally affected by ischemia or the hemorrhage. So um, the diagram here is from the book, and it's a diagram of neuroinflama uh, neuroinflammatory response after an ischemic stroke. So the gray area is ischemic, and the reactive microglia are releasing pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory chemicals. So reactive astrocytes stop maintaining neurons and instead release 
those neurotrophic and neurotoxic substances, including glutamate, and we'll talk more about glutamate in the neuroplasticity chapter. So um, in the ischemic area, dead neurons further stimulate glial cells. So the dying of the neurons actually initiates that glutamine response and causes more damage in the area. So just like in the rest of the body, inflammation can be beneficial and can be harmful, but of course, the nervous system, it's an important area, um, and you can have a profound effects from inflammation. So um, myelin, of course, is critical to conduction of information in the nervous system. Most neurons are myelinated. Um, there are very few that lack myelin. We can sort of think of them, instead of being myelinated and unmyelinated, you can think of them as more myelinated and less myelinated. So lots of um, advances have been made using cell implantation to enhance neuronal re um, regeneration and demyelinating disease and the following nerve trauma. So there are peripheral demyelinating diseases and central demyelinating diseases, and we'll talk a little bit about both of them. So in peripheral nervous system demyelination, um, peripheral neuropathy is a pathological change involving peripheral nerves. So that's a pretty broad term, peripheral neuropathy. Um, but often, peripheral neuropathies involve destruction of the myelin surrounding the largest and most myelinated sensory and motor fibers. So um, carpal tunnel syndrome, for example, and we'll talk about more about this in the peripheral nerve chapter, but um, the compression from, um, of the carpal tunnel can actually involve uh, destruction of the myelin sheath on the median nerve. So um, it's a peripheral demyelination disease. So when we have peripheral demyelination, um, it results in disruptive proprioception and weakness. And so as we know from tests and measures last summer, proprioception is the awareness of limb position. So the awareness of limb position, that can affect your function um, pretty profoundly. Okay, so um, a, an acute peripheral demyelinization syndrome is um, Guillain-Barre syndrome, and it involves acute inflammation and demyelination of peripheral sensory and motor fibers. So normally GBS occurs two to three weeks after a mild infection, like a uh, respiratory or intestinal infection. Um, and in two-thirds of cases, it is preceded by an intestinal infection that activates the immune system causing production of an antibody that mistakenly cross-reacts with the myelin sheath. So it's an autoimmune, it's um, an infection that triggers an autoimmune response. And we will find, as we go through different pathologies in the nervous system, a lot of um, neurodegenerative diseases and a lot of other nervous system diseases have, auto, have an autoimmune component. So the antibody is reacting with the myelin sheath, causing destruction of the myelin sheath. So um, this picture is from the book, and it's a nerve biopsy that shows peripheral demyelination and axon degeneration um, with severe Guillain-Barre syndrome. So people with GBS uh, might have difficulty with chewing, swallowing, speaking, and facial expressions. Uh, expressions. Pain can be a big um, factor in the acute stage of GBS. Um, patients often report to deep aching pain or hypersensitivity to touch, even to the point where like um, lying in bed with blankets on you is uncomfortable. Um, the onset is rapid, but it's usually followed by a plateau and then gradual recovery. And people often have complete recovery if they survive that initial phase. There's a, um, there's a start where you have difficulty with swallowing and chewing and speaking where you could also have difficulty with breathing. And so um, if you get um, treatment right away, some people have to be on a respirator for a couple days or a week. So um, then you can um, have gradual recovery. Um, treatment, medical treatment, can include plasmapheresis to get the antibodies out of your blood and um, intravenous immunoglobulin therapy to replace the antibodies. Um, people with GBS are usually going through PT and OT um, from the day they enter the um, 
ICU until way after. So um, that usually, um, I've worked with several people with Guillain-Barre, um, and most of them were in the hospital, and then they went to um, inpatient acute rehab, um, and then they came to me for outpatient therapy when they were in their recovery stage. So recovery from um, Guillain-Barre usually happens um, proximally to distally. So by the time they're coming into outpatient, a lot of times we're working on, well, of course we're working on walking and strengthening. And um, I've had, I, I think I talked about in the um, electrical stim lab, I had a guy who, who had Guillain-Barre and we were trying to stimulate his um, ankle dorsiflexors, his um, tibialis anterior, because he didn't have um, good muscle action in that. And I, when I, the first time I tried East stim with him, we couldn't get a contraction at all, even with high volt, no matter how high we turned it up. Um, and then a few months later, we got a good reaction, so he was getting return. So in the peripheral nervous system, there is a really good um, chance for return. And actually, um, that same guy, I see him um, skiing up at Mount Baker all the time. This was several, several years later. So um, he had full recovery, which is awesome. Central nervous system demyelination um, is multiple sclerosis. It often occurs when the immune system produces antibodies that attack oligodendrocytes, producing plaques in the white matter of the central nervous system. So it's that autoimmune response again. Um, it is, at this point, it's considered a multifactorial um, disease, it's autoimmune, it's a, due to a combination of genetic susceptibility, um, inadequate vitamin D levels, and in, inadequate sunlight exposure, or other factors. There might be other environmental factors that haven't been identified yet. Um, the signs and symptoms generally are weakness, lack of coordination, impaired vision is often one of the first signs people experience, double vision, impaired sensation, possibly slurred speech, disruption of memory and emotions is also possible. So I've worked with a lot of people with MS and everybody's symptoms are a little bit different. Everybody's course of the disease is a little bit different. Um, diagnosis is difficult. Um, MS usually manifests with one sign that then often completely resolves. So someone has double vision or impaired vision and then it resolves. So it's really hard for them to diagnose it in initial stages. Um, the other thing that I see, you know, I don't want to say frequently, but I've seen it a lot, is MS has almost become sort of what I call a garbage can diagnosis for a lot of other neural things. In other words, um, they can't figure out what's wrong with person, the person, so they say, well, they might have MS. Um, so I've, um, I was working with one lady who didn't have MS, um, nor did her daughter, but her daughter was having some neural symptoms and she got um, misdiagnosed as having MS. Um, her symptoms were, it, what she didn't have a typical course for what um, MS might be, and so she started having weirder and different symptoms, and she ended up going to um, a different neurologist, and it turns out she didn't have MS, she had a brain tumor. And her brain tumor was removed surgically, and she did have a really good recovery. But because she was misdiagnosed, it, it went a lot farther than it should have. So um, because diagnosis is difficult and the signs are variable, it can be, um, you can have other neurological problems that are misdiagnosed as MS. MS can be misdiagnosed as other things. So I was um, reading a book that a woman with MS wrote, a really good book actually, um, that um, she, when she first had her, her visual symptoms were her first symptoms, and um, she went to the Mayo Clinic, I think she lived in Atlanta at the time, she went to the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, and they diagnosed her as having postpartum depression. So, and it was a few years later that she got her MS diagnosis. So, um, really interesting in terms of diagnosis. Um, the onset of MS is commonly between 20 and 40 years of age. Women are three times more frequently affected than men. Um, 
The typical four types of MS are all named according to the course of the disease progression. Um, relapsing, remitting is frequently the um, most common initially. It's, um, they have a, um, an acute exacerbation of symptoms, then it remits, and the symptoms go away, and then later on they have another, um, so they can go through series of these relapsing and remitting. Part of that um, is what makes it difficult to diagnose. Secondary progressive is um, MS that starts with relapsing, remitting, and eventually the remission is not as complete. They start to decline in function. So every time they have a relapse, their remission is not complete, and so it progresses. Primary progressive is um, less common, and, and it's where um, you just start out Loop, you know, you don't ever have that relapsing, remitting. It just starts declining. And progressive relapsing, it's you start off with primary progressive, um, and then you have some relapses where you get a little bit better, and then worse, and a little bit better, and then worse. But the overall trend is worse. There is another type of MS which is very uncommon. It's called fulminating MS, and um, it's very fast progression, and people lose. Um, function very quickly with that, so it's definitely not as common. Um, of course, with MS, PT and OT are helpful to maintain and improve physical function, and we work with a lot of people with MS in um, PT with um, hugely variable levels of function and um, treatments. So a lot of people with MS are um, sensitive to high temperatures or excessive exertion. Fatigue is one of the hallmark um, symptoms of MS, and so you have to make your strength training programs uh, appropriate to avoid fatigue. Uh, people with MS can build strength, but they cannot do it in the same way as a healthy person. Um, vitamin D intake is important. Stress management is important. Regular exercise and proper medical management um, can slow the disease process. There are quite a few medications out there now that can really improve people's quality of life. Medications are hideously expensive. Um, one of our assignments this week is to research some of those MS medications and see what function they have in the body and um, the um, just their uh, effect on MS. So the interesting thing is there's a new, there's some of the newer ones that are out. It used to be by infusion, you'd have to go in every month or every few months and get it, um, uh, an IV and get the medication infused. But there's some oral um, disease modifying medications for MS that are out now. One of them is called Tecfidera. And it has some potentially really horrible side effects. Um, but a lot of people that I know that are on Tecfidera, um, they say that it's worth it. It's worth the potential for the side effects. So that's up, for, up to the individual person to decide. So another area of potential um, treatment that is um, kind of new and exciting <laughs> is neural stem cell treatment. So there's been a great deal of excitement concerning the possible role of uh, stem cells as brain implants um, for rehabilitation after injury or disease. So stem cells, neural stem cells, like other stem cells in the body, are immature, undifferentiated cells. And the neural stem cells are precursors to both neurons and glial cells. So um, they have the ability to self-renew and differentiate into most types of neurons and glial cells and populate developing and degenerating regions of the CNS. So um, pretty interesting. So neural stem cells in the healthy mature brain are involved in forming memories and learning new tasks. Um, and so there are a lot of potential rehabilitation implications for that. So um, hopefully there'll be some evidence-based therapies to help cellular transplants make new connections in the brain spinal cord or peripheral neurons with the potential to return people to full function. So, you know, with the kind of um, 
pharmaceutical research and stem cell research and things that are going on right now, I think there's a lot of hope in um, the MS community and in other um, um, diseases for um, some real uh, life-changing, life-supporting therapies. And so I think we're just, we're really on the cusp of some really exciting stuff. And in PT and OT, we are going to be involved in that stuff. So um, it's a really an exciting time to be in neuro rehab.